Um, so uh, again, hello and welcome to our November NHSR webinar on forecasting with multiple seasonality. My name is Anastasia and on the line with us, we will have Jane as well in a second. And uh, uh, me and Jane will be helping with some tech facilitation and managing questions today. Uh, we have Dr. Bamban uh, Rustin Tabar, a uh, senior lecturer in management sciences and college business school. And we also have Mitchell O'Hara, uh, she's a research assistant uh, from Monash University, um, and they will be running the session for us today. Uh, before we start, just a few bits of housekeeping. Uh, we'll be recording and we'll be sharing the materials afterwards on our website and on our YouTube channel. Um, also, uh, as we're now in Zoom, please, uh, please keep your microphone on mute. Uh, it's very important. Um, but also, if you want to have some interactivity, you're obviously very welcome to keep your cameras on. Um, we'll run until approximately 2 p.m. Uh, we start a bit later, so we will unfortunately have to overrun. If you have any questions, uh, please put them in the chat box and I will look after chat and we will moderate them. Um, also, uh, a few things to mention, uh, we are planning to run very soon webinars uh, on the third Wednesday of each month. Uh, if you're interested in running a webinar, please contact us via our email address, which is nhs.rcommunity at nhs.net. Uh, please do join our Slack. We'll share a link uh, with you in chat, uh, and uh, you will be able to be up to date with all events that are happening, and you'll be able to communicate with an analysts who are, are working in R. Uh, and also, we're planning to use Mentimeter at the end to gather feedback. Um, we will announce the link at the end, and we will make an announcement uh, with the details. Uh, please uh, leave feedback. It's very important for us. Our next webinar will be in January, uh, on 16th of January. Uh, it will be delivered by Gary Hudson and Andreas Satiradis, and it will be about R and Python. So uh, join us if you can. And without delay, uh, I will now hand over to uh, Bauman and Mitchell. Over to you now. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Bahman, and with Mitch, we're um, going to deliver this webinar. Um, I have to thank actually Mitch for uh, for being here. I know he's very late in, in Melbourne now, uh, but a special and huge thank to Mitch for what, what he's doing for forecasting community. You know, uh, I have been working with, with in the area of forecasting, especially with R over the past uh, four or five years uh, with R, and I know how easy it is now to actually um, doing forecasting with the packages Mitch has developed. So thank you very much for that. Okay, now let's um, let me share my screen. Can you can you see my screen? Uh, yes, we can. I'm okay. sure we can as well. Okay, thanks. So I'm I'm not actually going to talk a lot um, because Mitch is here, so he's the best person to talk about. Um, multiple seasonality with the packages he, he developed. But I think um, my idea is just to briefly talk about why this is important um, and then uh, some basic introduction to what Mitch is going to cover later on. So if you think about uh, the context of healthcare, um, I think you can find many examples where we uh, collect the data with the most detailed level of granularity. Uh, of course, when we talk about the level of granularity, we can uh, talk about uh, different things, but here uh, I'm referring to temporal granularity. But you can also talk about, uh, I don't know, um, individuals, as for example, patients, where you um, record uh, age, for example, or the type of injuries and uh, the variables like that. That brings also another dimension of granularity, but this is not what we want to discuss in this webinar. So um, there are many examples in healthcare where, um, as I said, data is, is collected with the most uh, detailed level of granularity, hospital admissions, a &E attendance, GP visits, NHS 1-1 calls, uh, clinical support desk are just a few examples. So what do I mean by this? Let's uh, just look at two examples. So this is a example from a clinical support desk. Uh, so it's, it's like a call center, basically. The, uh, so in this uh, support desk, they receive uh, calls from individuals and uh, they record many information. And one of the information they record is a time called accepted. As, as you can see here, we have the date. And then following that, we have the time with our minutes um, and, and seconds. And so this is actually the variable is most of interest for us in this webinar. 
So another example here is the accident emergency department. Again, here we have, uh, we have um, data recorded for many um, admissions over time. So here in each row, you see one admission with a, with a unique ID, and then they record also the gender of, of that admission, the, the gender of the person, basically, the type of injury, and then the most important thing for us is the arrival time. So here again, I have the date, and following that, I have the hour, minutes, and seconds. And I, as I said, you can find many other examples in healthcare, but uh, in, in other areas as well. So for the, for the rest of uh, the webinar and what Mish is doing actually is based on this data set, which is from the uh, real data from accident emergency department of a hospital. So when we talk about uh, the temporal data set, like what two examples I showed you, um, if you look at the, uh, the temporal variable in particular, for example, the arrival time, that variable contains actually many information. We can you know, extract uh, year, semester, quarter, month, up to um, you know, any interval like five minutes or 10 minutes, if it's relevant to what you want to do, you can extract those information from the, um, the temporal variable. So when you extract this information, uh, because we're talking about the, the time series and time series forecasting, uh, for each of those information we extract, we can create a different time series. With different frequencies from um, a half an hour, for example, to yearly. But again, uh, you can you can do it in any interval that is relevant to what you're doing. So now the question that actually uh, comes up is: uh, Okay, we can extract all this information, but do we really need to generate forecasts at all these levels? Um, I think in, in many um, modern organizations, including um, NHS and the healthcare sector in general, forecasts are required to inform decisions at multiple level of granularity. For example, if you think about the scheduling, you may need actually to generate the forecast for each half an hour. If you, if you think about the staffing, you may need to have the forecast at the daily level. Or if you think about the, the recruitment, you may actually need to look at the forecast at monthly level or at the, uh, at the quarterly or yearly level. So forecasts can be generated at the desired level of granularity that corresponds to the decision level, right? So the, the, the level you want to generate the forecast is uh, somehow dictated by the decision level that you have in your organization. But we can have a, another alternative. So instead of just generating the forecast at the level we want, we can generate the forecast actually at all the levels and then somehow combine them. And uh, this is something, well, if, if time allows, we may talk about this. Uh, I think this is the, one of the, the newest features of the FIPL package that, uh, that Mish developed. So in this webinar, we will show you actually how to go through various steps of tidy time series forecasting using the a &E data set. So what do we mean by tidy time series forecasting? So if you are familiar with tidyverse in general, so I think this is something you can connect with easily. Um, so we, in, in tidy time series workflow, we uh, tidied our data, then we create visualization, we do some preliminary analysis, then we specify a model uh, we want to use for the forecasting purpose, and then we train the model, we estimate the parameters, and then following that, we, we can evaluate um, how accurate is the forecasting model. Well, again, we can visualize um, the forecast and what we, um, and the, the accuracy as well. Uh, and then at the end of the day, we select uh, the best model from the list of models we have, and we can use that for uh, forecasting the, the, the variable we are interested in for the future um, and uh, use it in our organization. So this is basically different steps we go through in tidy time series forecasting. So how we do it? Well, uh, these are different packages uh, that uh, the team, I think in Monash University, they have developed. So the, the first package we're actually looking at is, is Tissable, uh, and then we have Fists and then Fable. Um, so Tissable is uh, mainly for, um, I, I would say preparing data for forecasting in this, in our case. And then FIST is to actually look at the features of 
the time series and create visualizations and Fable is for forecasting. Well, along with this, uh, we may also use the functions from Tidyverse, like we, we may use functions of deployer package or ggplot2 package. So I, if I'm uh, I focus on um, the tidy part only uh, before actually, because Mitch is actually going to, going to talk about uh, most of these steps here uh, uh, in more detail, like um, how to specify models, how to train, how to evaluate, and how to create forecast. But so here, um, I'm, I'm just briefly going through different steps we need to do uh, for the tidy part. So as you know, we have a data set. So the first thing we need to do is we need to import our data set into R and then we need to make sure it is in the tidy format. So following that, we need to check for duplications. If you have any duplicated observations um, in our data set, we need to find them and then fix them. And then, well, how do you fix them? Uh, either you can get rid of them, delete them, or you can make them somehow unique if, if you think they are genuine information and not just duplications. So after this, we can um, create a testable. I will come back to this to see what is a testable and why we need to create a testable here. And after creating a testable, uh, we check for um, time gaps um, or somehow we, we may call them implicit missing values as well, because sometimes you may, uh, when, when you record data at that level of granularity, uh, for example, if you think about the a and &E case, uh, uh, I don't know, at, this, at the particular day between, let's say, um, 1 a.m. and 2 a.m., actually, there was no admission. So if there is no admission, that time gap wouldn't show up in the data. So, uh, and if you want to work with the time series forecasting, you need to uh, check if there is any time gap like that. If there is any, uh, you need to find them and then fix them. And then after that, you can, uh, you know, go through um, all the sort of transformation and visualization things um, to explore the data and then make the data in a, um, in a format that is um, right for your forecasting exercise. So I actually, I called all these steps like a sort of pre-processing data for forecasting. So here, again, I'm not really, I, my intention is not to show you a lot of codes and things. Uh, Mitch is going to do it, but here, uh, well, this is uh, the first thing I do. I just import the data. And one thing you need to maybe to, to remember, and basically for the data set uh, we're using, so Mitch is based on Australia, I'm based in the UK. So it is important to make sure the time zone uh, is, um, is GB because this data set is from a hospital in the UK. So uh, when I import the data, basically I get a table. So you might be familiar with the table, so I'm not going to talk about this, but we have uh, columns or variables, and then we have rows or observations here. So because this is the table and I'm going actually to do some um, time series forecasting. So um, how can I actually do this? Well, if I just use the table that might not be possible because uh, I need to create a, what we call the time series object. And then that's why now we talk about testable. But first of all, before actually talking about testable, we need to talk about what is a time series. So time series can be thought of as a list of numbers along with some information about what time uh, those numbers were recorded. So basically in, in the simplest form, we have um, uh, two variables. One of them is time related, another one is like a measurement. So we can um, store this information using a testable object in R and that is why um, we talk about testable. But why do you need testable? I don't know if you have uh, already used different packages to do forecasting. So I, I had, uh, you know, experienced different uh, packages before Fable. So I have used, of course, forecast package uh, or um, Zoo. So in this case, or XTS, in this case, actually you need to create a time series object. And then uh, there are different functions to, depending on which package you're using, there are different functions to create the time series object and different functions from different packages may need different data structure, right? Uh, so that's one thing. Now, if you want to do forecasting with those packages and still you want to work with Tidyverse, it's, it's, it's not really uh, easy. So it's extremely difficult 
to juggle between these two. So I had this experience and it was frustrating till uh, you know, I, I found out about Tissable and then Fable that made my life really easy. So that's not the only thing why we, we recommend Tissable. Uh, you know, Tissable is also good when you have a irregular time interval like the example I showed you, or when you have multiple measured uh, variables or multiple grouping item, um, which is actually the case um, probably in many data sets. So why we need Tissable? Actually, we need Tissable to create a time series object that can be used later with, um, with other packages like Fist and Fable to create visualizations and um, to create forecasts. So what we have in Tissable? Well, you can, you can think about Tissable as a, as a table. Well, with the exception uh, here, we have uh, some uh, specific notation we need to remember. So in Tissable, we have something called index. Well, index is very easy to remember. It's corresponding to the temporal variable uh, in your table, right? So we have only one uh, index when we create a Tissable. But we can have key variables, and those variables are set of variables that define observational units over time. And we can have also measured variables. I think what is, uh, depending on, again, your, your data set, you may have key variables or not, you may have measured variables or not, but the index uh, must be there when you create a Tissable. What is really good with Tissable, it is very easy to convert with, with, to a table, but still, even if you're not converted with table, uh, you can use all the uh, tidyverse packages and functions in those packages to work with Tissable. So here is an example of the data set with a &E, how we convert it to, um, uh, to Tissable. So um, basically I had my table and then I use the function as underscore Tissable. And then inside this, I have to provide what are the keys uh, for this data set and what is the index. What is important to remember here, we have another extra argument called regular, and this is corresponding actually to our index. If you have an irregular uh, index, which is the case here because the, we don't have an equally spaced actually uh, index, um, so the, the distance between uh, different observations here are not equal. So if that is the case, you have to put regular equal to uh, false. But if you have like a daily time series already where you have equally spaced intervals, so uh, there is no need to put this equal to false. So this is important to remember. So if this is the case, the, the next thing you need to do um, is actually if you have an irregular index, you need to make it regular. So there are different ways to do it. One way um, I used to do it is actually use floor underscore date function from LibriData. And this will help me to create equally spaced um, index. Uh, and in this case, I want to create um, a half an hour actually time series. So, but this could be one hour, uh, five hours, any uh, four hours, any, anything that you think is relevant to, um, to your decision. And then following that, I will, uh, so I have to, um, first of all, um, you know, create this equally spaced. But then the function I'm using here is called index underscore by. This is a new function in Tissable. Somehow this is um, similar to group by uh, in, uh, in the plier. But if you work with Tissable and you want to some group by the index of your Tissable, uh, you have to use index underscore by. So I use index underscore by, and then I'm, I'm trying to create a half an hour um, space and I want to count the number of admissions for each half an hour. So I have to summarize and then I create a new name and then I count uh, all the observations that, that are corresponding to each half an hour. And if I run this, this is what I get in Tissable. Um, so what is important to remember in Tissable now, here I have an interval. So if, if you look at the previous one, here actually there's just a symbol uh, and there is no interval. So basically it, it tells us, I don't know what is this, what is this interval? But here it tells us, well, the intervals is 30 minutes. Uh, here you can see also the time zone. Um, and uh, well, this is basically our index here now. Um, so I created Tissable and then I make it regular because it was irregular. Um, and then after that, I have to check for uh, 
time gaps. There are different functions I can use here, uh, but the function I'm using here is called has underscore gaps. Again, this is from Tissable, and this function will tell me whether there is any time gap in our data or not. There are some other functions you can use, you know, if you want to count them or to show what are the gaps. So if that is the case, and it was the case in our data set, we have some temporal gap, I need to, uh, to fix those gaps. Um, and then the way I do it uh, here is I use the function called fill underscore gaps. Um, and then I say, whenever there is a temporal gap, uh, put admission equal to zero, right? So wherever there is a temporal gap, uh, just replace it, replace the admission with zero. Uh, again, here you don't see any changes, but if you check later the admission, you will see now we have some admissions, some, some uh, uh, indexes where the admission is equal to zero. Okay, so now while well, we talk about the, the webinar is about multiple seasonality um, and uh, whatever I covered so far is basically just some pre-processing data that we need uh, for the webinar to go through um, the, the temporal, I'm sorry the temporal, excuse me, for, um, I think my mouse is doing something. So yeah, so whatever I covered is just the pre-processing which is required for, for the rest to talk about multiple seasonality. But uh, what do you mean by seasonality or multiple seasonality? Well, seasonality, uh, we, we define it as a regularly repeating patterns of highs and lows related to the calendar time. Um, and then here, when we say calendar time, you may talk about the season, a quarter, month, or day of week, hour of day, uh, and so on. So this is just seasonality. So if you have one seasonality, so you can observe it in the time series. So if you have at least two types of seasonality that exist in your time series, then we talk about multiple seasonality. So basically, with, uh, with the time series I had before, I can create um, as I said, using the functions in Tissable, any time series I want, monthly, hourly, daily, quarterly, or yearly. So I'm not going to show you, I think Mitch later may talk about this, but here I just briefly go through um, three time granularities of the time series we have here. So basically this is a seasonal plot for the monthly data. I'm sorry, this, this is definitely wrong. I don't know why it shows me that, but it should be um, actually different month of the year. So January, February, March, April, up to December, right? Uh, so, and then here what happens is we overlap the, uh, the time series for each year. Uh, so because we talk about seasonality and we see, we, we said that in seasonality, we see repetitive patterns. Uh, actually this plot is the, is a very good plot to show us those repetitive patterns. And as you can see, this is happening. Like in every uh, February, we have uh, you know, low uh, number of admissions comparing to the rest of the year. And then again, in um, this month, it might be, uh, I think September, we have more uh, people in, in the admission. So again, we see this repetition in the month. What if we go actually to the daily level? So again, here in the data, we see a sort of outlier there, but we need to deal with that as well. Uh, if you look at the, the day of week, uh, well, it, the, the seasonality is not very strong here. Um, we have a, a variation, but still we can see that Monday um, and Sunday are higher comparing to the rest of the, of the week. What if you look at the hourly? Again, we see uh, a pattern in the hour of the day now. Uh, that definitely repeating um, uh, so across uh, all the data set. Uh, and again, all, and in all this uh, data, I'm actually using, in all these graphs, I'm using all the data set. So basically here, I plotted all the weeks I have in the data. So each line here is corresponding to uh, one week. And then here, each, um, each line here is corresponding to one day, 24 hours. So, you know, if we just look at these three graphs, we realize that actually we have more than two seasonalities in any data set. Uh, so we have uh, definitely hour of the day. We have day of week, it's not very strong, but still it is there. And then we, we have uh, month of the year as well. If you look at, you know, the, the half an hourly and weekly, we may still observe uh, some seasonalities there as well. And this is why um, it's important uh, to talk about multiple seasonality because 
in many data sets like this one that I show you, um, there is a strong presence of uh, different seasonalities at different levels. And we need to, uh, to figure out how to uh, do time series forecasting in a situation like this. I think I should stop here. Sorry if I, I don't know how much time actually I took. Um, so I'll stop sharing and then Mitch, uh, you can share your screen now. Let's, excuse me, let's get this started. If Zoom will give me the right window. Okay, hopefully you see me on the big screen now. Yeah. Stop the video. Great. Hello, everyone. Let's have a look at the slides. Hopefully there's not too much delay between my voice and the share. I think it's fine. It's okay. Great. Wow, there's a lot of people here. Thank you all for coming. And sorry for the mix up with Zoom and Teams. Had some trouble getting Teams working. Uh, I think it was an authentication issue. Uh, today I'm talking about multiple seasonality and Barman's already introduced uh, quite a lot of the important bits, I think. Uh, he mentioned that the data preparation is just the grunt work that you need to do before you model and before I talk about the interesting stuff. But I think the data preparation step is actually one of the most important um, parts of the process. So hello everyone, wherever you are. For me, it's actually quite late now. It's past midnight. So I hope you're all having a wonderful Wednesday from the future. Mm -hmm. And before I begin, I would like to start by uh, acknowledging the traditional owners of the land from which I am presenting this webinar from, the people of the Kulin Nations, and I pay the, my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. Okay, so hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll have a bit more of an understanding of what multiple seasonality is and how you can uh, produce forecasts that represent a multiple seasonal pattern. And there's many different structures uh, in which multiple seasonality can be presented. So first of all, the simple question, uh, Bauman gave a couple of definitions for what is seasonality. I'll give an even simpler one. Uh, in my book, simplicity is king. So it's just a pattern which repeats over a fixed period of time. The fixed period of time is very important. So for example, every 24 hours, you have the same shape that would be a daily seasonal pattern. Every uh, seven days would give you a weekly seasonal pattern, but that pattern should look similar from week to week. And generally that pattern doesn't change very much. So it might look a little bit like this. Here is a pedestrian traffic from one of my local train stations. And you can see Monday through uh, Friday, the weekdays, there is a strong seasonal pattern with everyone going to work in the mornings, having a lunch break in the middle of the day about your time, and going home in the evenings. You can see every 24 hours this repeats and the shape looks relatively similar for each of the days. So then we ask what is multiple seasonality and perhaps the simplest definition I could give is that there's at least two or more of those seasonal patterns. And if we zoom out a little bit more from the previous graph, we might have something that looks like this. Here we can see in the middle, I think it's over here, uh, was the four days that we saw earlier. Five days would be right in the middle, actually. And on the weekends, no one needs to go into the city to go to work, so there's a very different pattern. However, that weekend seasonal pattern is consistent. So it is still seasonality, even though it alternates. So we've got multiple seasonal patterns here, one for the weekdays and one for the weekends. And at the start of this, you can see another interesting dynamic. We've actually got a couple of holidays uh, in early April, and they represent a very similar shape to the weekend. So if we think about uh, writing a model that will capture this pattern, uh, we may be able to save some complexity by lumping those two categories together so that it's either a working day or a non-working day will describe the structure of the daily seasonal pattern. Uh, feel free to put um, questions in the chat. You can, I'm not sure if you would commonly do this, but I don't mind if you unmute your mic as well and just introduce yourself and ask a question. 
there should be plenty of time for a, an informal discussion here. So now that we know a little bit about what a seasonal pattern is, we can then consider how can we represent that mathematically? How can we include these seasonal patterns into a model? And I like this picture of a tree because this is a seasonal feature as well. The growth rate of the tree depends on the seasons, the weather. So you can see the uh, visualization of the seasonality. So I think I thought about it a bit. There's four main ways in which I would model seasonality and roughly ordered here uh, in terms of simpleness or ease to obtain. Uh, we've got seasonal dummy variables, lag terms, Fourier terms, and exogenous regressors. So seasonal dummy variables would be the first type of seasonal method that you would be introduced to if you were learning time series and statistics. And that's because it's the simplest to implement and the simplest to interpret. It just gives a separate intercept for each day of the week if you are trying to model a weekly seasonality. So for example, uh, we can include six regressors here, dummy variables what, representing each day of the week. And if it was a Monday, we have a uh, value of one for D1, and that will change the intercept for that day. And if for each weekday you change the intercept, you'll result in a repeating shape, a seasonal pattern. Uh, but there's a couple of limitations with this method in that if you've got many terms, for example, if you had a daily pattern, you would need 23 of these dummy variables. Remember that you don't need to include all days or all hours uh, for the dummy variable trap. You need to drop one because the Sunday is inheriting from the intercept of the model overall. So if you have more uh, longer seasonal periods or higher frequency data that we're looking at today with the half hourly or event data, uh, you'll need a lot more regressors in your model. Uh, it also can't handle more complicated seasonal patterns. So if you think of how many weeks there are in a year, it rounds out to about, to about 52.18 or thereabouts. And there's no way you can represent de decimal or non-integer seasonality using seasonal dummies. Lag terms are uh, a very simple idea of saying today will be just like yesterday. The shape of tomorrow is going to look exactly the same as today or some similar structure. So you can have some coefficient with the lag term as well in order to combine the lags of multiple days in the past and be a bit more sophisticated. Uh, the simplest form which I've plotted on the right here is the naive model. And this is actually very difficult to beat the accuracy of. Uh, it consistently performs very well in uh, competitions. It's a benchmark uh, and any improvements above the naive, you have to work fairly hard to achieve. Uh, the problem, the natural problem for lag terms is if you say today will be uh, just like yesterday, then what will tomorrow be? If you haven't observed today, then you'll have some trouble forecasting two days ahead because your model requires the information from one day before. So instead we substitute the forecasts and that gets a little bit trickier um, depending on the model framework you use. And once again, this can't handle non-integer seasonality because it's referring to uh, fixed time lags. So if you have uh, a weekly data set and you want to check the seasonality from one year ago, there isn't some exact week which was one year ago. It would be halfway between a given week. Okay, the third and I think most valuable or most important to learn if you haven't already um, gotten familiar with these is Fourier terms. And for a seasonal pattern being something that repeats over a fixed time, period of time, it makes sense to model that with a function which also repeats over a fixed period of time. So sines and cosines are inherently seasonal and you can control the seasonality uh, by dividing by this m here, m being the seasonal period. So two pi being the length of a period scaled back by your uh, seasonal period of the data gives you some regressors which are infinitely defined. These are continuous functions rather than dis the discreteness of the other terms, uh, which can be used in a model and represent your seasonality. Uh, here's a visualization of a 
uh, full seasonal period with one of the data sets. And you can see as we increase the harmonics, that is to say the uh, frequency of a given Fourier term, uh, the period halves or is um, scaled up by a little bit. So you have more repeats. So the red line and the blue line only go through one cycle. And that refers to the first two harmonics. And sorry, the first harmonic, which is the first two terms. And then the second harmonic or the sec uh, third and fourth terms repeat twice. If you had three harmonics, it would repeat three times and so on. Now, these are the only downside to these is that they can be hard to interpret. Now, you can, of course, um, scale the model results, your coefficients that you get from the model, apply that to your data or your Fourier terms, and get a visualization of the seasonality. But it isn't as easy as just directly interpreting the coefficients of a model. But the benefits far outweigh this cost, in my opinion, because it can handle non integer seasonality. There's no, um, no requirement for this M to be an integer because sine and cosine is a continuous function. And also it is a very uh, customizable term in that if you had a very slowly moving or smooth term, for example, we talked about the dummy variables for uh, hourly data with a daily seasonality, you'd need 24 terms. You can actually control the number of terms you want to use in your model, depending on how flexible or how wiggly the time series pattern is. So if you had a very sharply changing pattern, you can have a large number of harmonics or a lot of terms. But if it's a very slowly moving pattern, you can only you, you can get away with using less terms. And if you picture using capturing an annual data set or an annual seasonal pattern with half hourly data, you'd be well into the thousands of terms there. And you can capture that which won't, won't change very quickly, you can capture that with only a few uh, harmonics. So instead of thousands of regresses, you could just use uh, 10 or so. Okay, next up, I would like to mention exogenous regresses, and these are almost the gold standard. If you can find good regresses which describe or uh, correlate with the seasonal pattern that you're experiencing, then it's very nice to include them. So here I've plotted the identifying regressor for if it was a working day or non-working day. And you can see that contains a lot of structural information about the time series. Now I say this is better than just including seasonal terms or time-based regressors. Uh, and that's because if something unexpected or new happens in the data set in the future, uh, which you can predict based on data collection or something else, uh, using exogenous regressors will more accurately forecast those unexpected changes into the future. So for example, because we're using uh, working days or non-working days here, rather than weekdays and weekends, uh, we, if, if the government was to introduce a new holiday, then the model will be able to adapt and change its behavior so that it doesn't treat it like a working day pattern and instead gives it the uh, simpler weekend pattern or non-working day pattern. Uh, but the benefits um, can be difficult to maintain because it can be hard to collect that data set and you need to maintain the uh, location or the collection of temperature data or holiday data. And if you need to forecast them and you're less confident about what the future values are, for example, temperature, you won't know exactly what it will be in the future, they will need to be forecasted as well. So I particularly recommend exogenous regressors for things that are easy to forecast, for example, holidays. Okay, so there's the four seasonal patterns or seasonal terms that I suggest uh, learning about. Uh, which one should you use for your data set or your example? Well, when you've got multiple seasonal patterns, you may need to use many of those methods, a mixture of the above. So for example, with electricity demand, we may be able to capture the annual pattern of the data set using temperature, because as it gets really hot in Australia, the uh, heat waves that come through really increase the electricity because the cooling comes in, uh, people run their air conditioners. And during winter, they run their heaters as well. It's not directly correlated with the time of the year, instead the temperature 
which is correlated with the time of the year. Uh, however, for the within day, uh, within day pattern, so the hours into days, the daily seasonal pattern, uh, it's more correlated with human behavior. So going to work, uh, offices running all their lights and equipment, and people going home. So that would be more suitable for a time-based seasonal pattern with Fourier terms. Uh, but in short, just use what works best for you and best for your data. Um, there's no need to try and uh, get exogenous regresses if they're not available. So just do the best that you can. Okay, this one's a big slide, but here is a brief summary of the most important, or some of the most important multiple seasonal models that I have, in my opinion. Uh, do note that it's non-exhaustive and is statistical methods only. Um, there's some great machine learning algorithms in this um, area, but they do uh, end up uh, matching with some of these categories regardless. So for example, if you've got a neural net, it might be similar to these regression type models, or if you've got a recurrent neural net, it might be more like these uh, state-space models. Uh, but in short, uh, most of these models can capture any, uh, can use any of these types of seasonalities, uh, with the exception in particular of double seasonal halt winters, uh, which can only use dummies, and bats and t-bats, which depending on what you're using, uh, will have dummies or Fourier terms. I've, uh, generally speaking, we can group these into uh, categories. There's a question in the chat. Where do you fit mixed models under MLR? Yes, so I would consider mixed, uh, mixed effects models to be part of the regression family here. Uh, so we can group these collections of models into three simpler categories, into regression type models, state space models, and decomposition models. So we can describe their overall behavior a bit simpler. And before I show you this table, it all really depends on your data and model complexity. So it, this table is just a general rule. It's nothing specific about the model though. So generally regression models tend to be flexible because you can specify any regression terms that suit your data. You'll notice that when I showed the types of seasonal terms that can be used, generally these regression models could use any of the seasonal terms. Uh, the speed is also fast and that's because uh, there's no iterative process required to estimate it over time. Because regression is more of a cross-sectional method, but you can use seasonal features to describe it, uh, it ends up being really fast. State space, on the other hand, is more purpose-built for a given problem. So historically, they haven't been flexible uh, in terms of the types of seasonality that you can include or regresses, and they're a bit slower. Uh, and they're slower because they use the time dynamics to update the model automatically. And that's where this evolving terms comes in. So if the structure of the seasonality changed, uh, if for example, people started going to work a little bit earlier for the pedestrian traffic, uh, the state space models will be able to adapt. Whereas the regression model will end up giving you uh, something in between. It will be uh, neither right at the start of the data set where people were going to work uh, late, maybe nine o'clock, and it will be not right at the end of the data set when people are going to work earlier at eight o'clock. It'll be giving you something in result in between, like 8.30. And there are ways around that. You can just ignore the first part of the data set, but generally speaking, state-space models give you a truer representation of how a time series behaves. And lastly, decomposition here um, depends on a lot of things, and that's because it uses a decomposition, such as an STL decomposition, to extract each of the separate seasonal components. So it'll give you a time series consisting only of the annual seasonality, the weekly seasonality, and the daily seasonality, and then you can use simpler methods to forecast them separately. So the flexibility depends on what models you use to forecast the components. Same with the speed. Uh, it is tending to be a little bit faster than state space because you're able to use simpler models to produce the component forecasts. 
Okay, so how do we produce these forecasts in R? Uh, before we get to this, there is a question on simple seasonal averages. Uh, would this fit under decomposition? So it depends. If you're using simple seasonal averages to decompose the data, for example, using a classical decomposition, you can do that. So you can use averages to get the seasonal components and then model those seasonal components along with the other stuff and combine it. Then you could say it's a decomposition. Uh, generally, for when you're talking about averages, uh, you're in the regression framework. So if you're fitting a model, which is just y against your dummy variables for seasonality, which I assume you mean by sim simple seasonal averages, uh, that will give you the uh, average of January's um, demand, February's demand, and so on. Uh, that is just a simple multiple linear regression model. Uh, so clarification on that. The question is about basic call center type approaches, uh, seasonality at a weekly level and model trends and intraday stuff. Yeah, so those types of features can be captured with any of these models and your choice on uh, the model depends on what you want out of it. So if you want to include a lot of these uh, features that you want to handcraft, uh, you may be looking for a more flexible model. However, if you're looking for something, if the patterns in this data set change very quickly, you might need a state space model so that you don't need to keep updating the, the definition or the fitting of the model. Okay, so I am the lead author of the Fable package and you're welcome to ask any questions about that. Uh, so the content of this talk and how we actually do the forecasting in R will be focused on the Fable package. Uh, in addition to this, I also have to introduce a few other packages, in particular the Sybil package, which Barman uh, introduced how to produce a Sybil. You'll be quizzed on this very soon. And there's some example data sets in Sybil data. And the Feasts package uh, allows you to produce some graphics and some exploratory analysis. Uh, Barman also introduced the tidy forecasting workflow. And I'll do my best to follow this uh, roughly. So I'll spend a lot of time on tidying the data, the uh, hospital admissions data, and then we'll spend a little bit of time on visualizing it. And then at the end, we will have some time to finish this workflow and get our forecasts. Uh, I do have to say that the forecasting part of this uh, is a little bit limited. So there'll be plenty of time for questions and we can have some Q&A at the end. Uh, before we start with tidying, there's a question on coronavirus. It has made a horrible mess of your forecasting models. Any tips? So it has made a terrible mess of my forecasting models as well. In particular, I am currently working with tourism research for Australia. And as you might imagine, tourism has uh, plummeted. There is very little tourism here. Um, because of coronavirus, there's no travel that is allowed, of course. And in order to model that, there's a few strategies, and it might change the question that you're asking. Uh, one thing that you could do is produce counterfactual forecasts. And what that means is, suppose COVID never happened, stop the data set at the end of 2019, and forecast into the future. Now, that's still useful information, because it allows the uh, re recipient of the forecasts to know or to uh, to gain the information of what they could have expected if COVID wasn't the thing, wasn't a thing. So that helps with estimating the loss and um, better planning for uh, the business. Another thing in order to produce the real forecasts that you might want to do is have a model that can adapt very quickly. So that's where the state space framework um, might come in um, handy. However, with COVID, because it's such an extreme change into the dynamics of the series, uh, you may not be able to produce a model for it at all. And that's because this type of event hasn't been observed before in that data set. Uh, with a little bit more history that we've got now, uh, where most of the way through the year, uh, the model might have some data, set, um, data now to produce more recent forecasts, especially if you're observing data really frequently, like daily or sub-daily. Uh, however, what we've done with Tourism Research Australia is because the data was coming in at monthly or quarterly, 
uh, we sent out a bunch of surveys. We got expert opinions from thousands of experts and we asked them under three scenarios, an optimistic scenario, a realistic scenario and a pessimistic scenario and what they would expect the tourism to be in a year's time and a couple of years time in some cases as well. So using those thousands of opinions, uh, we could produce uh, expert forecasts, uh, not so much based on a model, but based on uh, expert opinion. And we hope that it works out fairly well. It's a very unusual situation to be forecasting. in. Okay, I will talk about data preparation, then I'll get back to your question. Uh, so the data that Barman's introduced it and provided is available on GitHub here. And in short, there's a data folder and we've got three data sets to work with. Uh, the actual admissions, the holidays that occurred during that time frame, and the temperatures. So loading in this data really uh, quickly. Uh, we just read CSV, pass the link to the file. And because this arrival time is a little bit uh, unusually formatted. It's up here. We need to specify that format as the column. Otherwise, we would have to do this in a future step. It's just neater to get it done at read time. And in this case, uh, Barman used the ID, but I checked and it didn't seem very useful to me. It was just a row identifier, so I've dropped this. Um, you should let me know if I'm wrong in doing that, if it was important somewhere, but I didn't find that uh, necessary. And as a result, we get this data set with three columns, gender, the type of the injury, and the exact time to the minute that they arrived. Uh, we've also got this holiday data set read in much the same way. However, this time it's only daily data. So we don't have the event level data. So we change our column format. And I also found at the end of this data set, there were some empty rows. Uh, so I've just removed them from the data set. Lastly, we've got temperature. Uh, notice that this is also a daily time series. So we've got that same format here. Uh, no data issues this time. And you can see we can check that it matches. We've got 2,282 rows for temperatures and the same for holidays. So the time range, uh, because they both start on the same day, probably line up very well. Now, this is just reading in the data, nothing time series here. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce the Sybil package uh, for representing your time series. And here's Ira's thesis that she wrote about the Sybil package. But in short, the index is the time variable that orders observations, and key variables are used to uniquely identify each time series. So your data set at, in a Sybil format might look like here, like this. You've got your time index, your key variables, and your measurements. So usually we'd forecast our measurements. Okay, a quick quiz. You can think of it to yourself or put it in the chat, I don't mind. We've got our temperatures data set uh, from these columns, which are our index variables and which are our key variables. Uh, sorry, sorry, Mitch, just a qu question. Um, wh when when you create a testable, is it the combination of keys and index that must be unique or is it just a combination of keys? Uh, so the keys must, must uniquely identify the index. And what that means is that uh, there must be no duplicates in the time index for a given set of keys. So if, if we had in this data set uh, 20, 2010, 01, 01 repeated twice, then we would need some key to identify each of them separately. Yeah, so the, the reason of you know having the ID from the admission data is if you just work with that data only without um, temperature uh, or holidays, then you get some duplicated rows. Yeah, so I've got a different solution for that. Great. Okay, so you may think correctly, hopefully, that the index is the date variable. There's our time observations. And for the key variable, in this case, as it currently stands, there is no key variable. Uh, we could, of course, rearrange this data set a little bit to make a key variable necessary if we converted this to a long format where we had actual and forecast as a column 
identifying the temperature. Then our key could be the type of temperature that we're observing, and the measurement in that case would be the temperature. Uh, so for this one, it was just the date variable is the index. So you can set key equals null or ignore that entirely. And what you get from that is a Sybil and the interval is automatically identified to be a daily interval. This time we have the holidays data set. And once again, very briefly, have a think about what the index variable and the key variables would be here. There's a few more columns to consider. Okay, uh, no differences this time. The index is the date variable and all of these variables are measurements because uh, there is no uh, need to identify each of these dates. They are already unique. Okay, this one's the tricky one. So we've got the admissions data set. And here we've got three variables. Which ones are our index variables or index variable and which are our keys? And also in that case, what are our measurements here? Okay, so the trick in this question is that there aren't actually any measurement variables yet. So you may think that the index is arrival time. There is our time variable. And our key, I would say in this case, is gender and type. So these, the key variables tend to be categorical descriptions of a data set. Now you could consider this a measure, these two as measurement variables as well depending on how you wanted to structure the data set. Uh, if you considered these as measurement variables, you'd have to be a little bit more careful about this arrival time. Uh, however, if these were measurement variables, then you'd have index is arrival time and key is null. I went with the first option and I get a pesky error. It says that the Sybil is invalid and that's because uh, there are some duplicate indices which Barman suggested there would be uh, if I only had these two keys. And we can use the duplicate function to identify which ones, which observations they are. There's actually 82,000 duplicates. So at exactly 1.37 a.m. presumably uh, on the first, of 20, first day of 2010, there were two minor injury females arriving. So that's not uniquely identifying the data set. So to fix this, we can produce our own uh, measurement variable. We can count the number of people that arrived exactly at uh, the first day of 2010 at exactly four, um, 12.48 AM. And in this case, there was only one arrival. So now we're able to produce our Sybil and you can see we've got a minute interval. So the granularity here is one minute. Uh, you'll notice I've been a little bit lazy here. Barman did the right thing and set it to the Great Britain time. Uh, here I've lazily left it as UTC and my excuse is that I couldn't fit it on the page. Uh, a question in the chat is key equals factors uh, not used in the Sybil previously and index is the track of the individual cases. So the index is the always the time variable. That's usually the simplest to identify and the key variables uh, identify separate time series. So in this case, you can see there's four different time series that exist in this Sybil. Uh, the gender column contains two values, female and male, and the type column contains two values, major and minor. So in total, that gives us four separate time series that we can look at. So usually the key variables are categorical in some way, but that's not necessarily true. Okay, so we've got these three separate data sets and we want to produce one uh, combined data set that we can use, down, use in our models. Uh, but it's not, not easy. We've got three different data sets which have different intervals. So our admissions data set is measured every minute and holidays and temperatures every day. So we need to think a little bit more about 
um, how we want to set up this admissions data set. So what granularity, granularity being the interval of the data set, should we have? Now, I think this is a not very um, discussed, not discussed very often, but I think it's particularly important. Uh, it's a balancing act. So there's two conflicting um, opinions here or two conflicting actors. So the first uh, need for this granularity is that you need to have enough detail to forecast. If you have uh, the event level data set, it's, either gonna, it's probably going to be one person showed up or one person didn't show up. It's very uncommon to have more than one person. So you need to aggregate that a little bit. So maybe every 30 minutes or every hour or every day. Uh, the next balancing act is uh, maybe the person you're producing forecasts for wants the forecast to be every 15 minutes or every day or something. Uh, generally, this, uh, these two opinions are compatible. However, um, that's not always the case. So you might need to balance between them. So this is an important consideration because if you aggregate your data set a lot, you'll have less seasonal structures. If you have only 30 minute data, you might have more seasonal structures. You might exist a daily pattern, uh, a weekly pattern and an annual pattern. But if you aggregate to daily or weekly data sets, you'll start losing some of those daily and weekly patterns. So there's a few options for us here. Uh, the first option is to keep it as it is. So here I've just um, added up across the male and female and uh, the type of injury, major or minor. And there were a lot of missing values, a lot of gaps. So I filled them in with uh, zero arrivals. And plotting this, I get something that's not very interesting. Mm -hmm. I get a lot of values that are zero, some mm -hmm. that are one, uh, and some that are two or three. Uh, the second option is that we aggregate to 30 minutes. And here we start to see some interesting structures. So we've got some repeating pattern. This is our daily seasonal pattern. Uh, some unusual peaks. Maybe if you squint, you might struggle to see a weekly pattern here, uh, but it's a very weak pattern. Uh, but now we're starting to see a little bit more structure that we can do something with. This looks like something we might be able to forecast. Uh, the next option, maybe we go one step further. Uh, we go one hour intervals. And here, this patterns are getting a lot smoother. So this should be much easier to forecast than the half hourly data set. See how noisy this is? It's a lot more jagged, a lot more up and down. Uh, if we go to the one hour, it's a nice and smooth. So it's going to be much easier for us to fit a model to this data. Uh, we could go further. We could aggregate this to the daily data set. Uh, notice, by the way, I'm using floor date, just like Barman did. And we're using the index by so that we can change the index of the Sybil much like group by would. Uh, so the daily data set, we've now lost that hourly pattern that we saw. Here we saw some very strong seasonal shapes, but when we aggregate to daily, they're gone, essentially. Uh, you might be able to see the weekly pattern in here, as, um, here still, but it's a fairly weak pattern to see. Uh, we could go even further and look at monthly aggregations. Uh, this code for some reason didn't update correctly. Uh, that should say, oh no, I'm using year month to aggregate it. Uh, this floor date's not necessary at all in that case. Uh, but you can see uh, we don't have a lot of time series seasonality here anymore. The only seasonality we might expect to see is an annual seasonality, uh, which you can kind of see here. We've got some drop here followed by a peak and then the year immediately after has that same shape. But for this data set, the seasonality is relatively weak beyond the daily pattern. Okay, so reminder of what's best. We need to balance between the detail. We need to make forecasts, make sure there's enough detail, and we need to um, make sure the forecasts are good enough for the, sorry, other way around. We need to make sure the forecasts have enough use. So there's not much purpose producing annual forecasts for the admissions when you need to know it every 30 minutes. So it depends, and I know you might shrug at that answer, but for this case, I think uh, if the purpose was to give a multiple seasonality webinar, 
I would pick a data set that has multiple seasonality. So either option B or C. And I'm going to pick C because it is uh, going to be easier to forecast. There's nicer, smoother patterns. There's more signal. OK, so to do this, we have floored our index variable by hours. And we can add up the arrivals that occurred in that hour. And we've filled in the, the, the hours where there were no people arriving to have zero arrivals. And here's our resulting civil. So now you can see the interval is one hour. Uh, just as an aside, uh, you don't always have to choose a single granularity. Maybe you wanted to choose a couple and that can improve your forecasts. So if you produce forecasts at multiple levels, at the hourly level, daily, monthly, and annual, you can actually combine those resulting forecasts using temporal reconciliation, and that might give you better results. So uh, this process of making sure that the hourly results add up to the daily results, which add up to the monthly and so on, uh, will improve your forecasts. So I'll copy these slides uh, into the chat for reading after this session. Okay, so now that we've uh, chosen a, a suitable interval for our admissions data set, uh, it still doesn't line up exactly, but we'll be able to bring it all together a bit better now. So in this case, I think holidays is okay to be daily because the holiday applies to the entire day. However, it's a little unfortunate that temperatures are at the daily level because we would expect that the temperature to vary throughout the day and that might affect the admissions for a given hour. So in this case, I would be looking for more detailed temperature data which I think would be available if you looked for it. Okay, so the first step here is to produce a common variable for the merge. So I've computed the date variable, this column here, from my date time. So now I've got an hourly data set, which also has a daily column. Then I can left join uh, in the holiday data set. Uh, do note that it's a left join because I want to keep all of the observations in my left data set, which is admissions, and only add in the holidays data set when the date column matches. And that's why I've set by equals to date. And just so that it fits on the page nicely and to keep our uh, analysis simpler, I've kept only the public holiday variable. So I've just taken holidays and selected that variable Uh, next, we can do the same thing with temperatures. And because it had the same structure, we can use the exact same code. Once again, I'm not going to use the forecasted temperature. Keeping it simple, I'll only pull in the actual temperature. And I've saved this as the hospital data set. OK, uh, next we want to visualize the data set and get familiar with the seasonal patterns that exist. Uh, before I do this, I want to answer an older question in the chat. Uh, it was about a regression setting. Are there many way, are there ways to model seasonality which work better together? So if you had uh, many seasonal patterns, do Fourier terms work better in combination with dummies or lag terms? I think it's uh, often better to use a variety of, um, of ways of capturing your seasonality. Um, most importantly, I find it helpful to mix exogenous regressors with Fourier terms. And that's because if um, this, the time-based variables interact, overlap in some way, um, they might be uh, strongly determined with each other and cause some estimation problems. But if you're able to combine a time-specific variable, such as a Fourier term, with something that isn't as strongly tied to time, such as temperature or as an exogenous regressor, uh, that in my experience has given me good results. Okay, on to visualization. So if you've worked with hourly data sets before, you may have tried to plot them and you get this big blob of black ink on your page. So this doesn't tell us very much about the series other than the number of arrivals is usually between uh, zero and 40, but we've learned nothing about the seasonality. And this is actually a really difficult problem to solve and a fairly active area of research in my department. So one thing that you could do to see a little bit more detail is just to throw out most of the time series and focus only on a small portion of the data set. 
uh, with the obvious problem of maybe missing part of the data set. So we might miss some outliers or some important features. So here is that same graph, but I've focused into the first few weeks. And as I pan across this data set, uh, you can see it all looks pretty similar. Uh, but if I were to expand the window, you can see very quickly, I lose the detail and I can't make much of it. So I think it's actually better to uh, have a look at summary measures of the data set. And one way to do that is to summarize your data set. So we had our, uh, sorry, we had hourly data before, and now I've produced monthly data set using the year month function. Summarizing the total arrivals allows me to simply plot this with a seasonal plot, in this case, a subseries seasonal plot um, to show the seasonality at a yearly level. And this uh, is much simpler. There's less lines to overlap with everything. Uh, and we can see from the blue lines, which represent the average, that January and February, even December a little bit, are lower than average for admissions or arrivals. Uh, whereas the March through July tends to be a bit higher with the peak in October as well. Now, there's some uh, conflict here in that the number of days in the month might be determining this. So a common um, source of error in analysis is thinking, oh, for some reason, not many people are going to hospital in February, uh, but they would neglect to consider that there's less days in February. So a lot of this behavior, this seasonal pattern, I think can be attributed to that. Okay, another visualization you might be interested in is how the data changes over weeks. So making the same visualization, of course, I can't aggregate it to the monthly data set to see weekly patterns. So I've aggregated it to daily data and summed up the arrivals and plotted it over weeks. And here there's not much structure again. Uh, there are more arrivals on Mondays and Sundays, but a very weak seasonal pattern here. If we do the same for daily data, in this case, I don't need to aggregate it at all. Hourly is perfect for this. Uh, we can see a lot more signal. So in this case, the uh, night hours are less common for arrivals and during the day is much more common. I think a better visualization of this um, comes from raw ggplot code, making it a bit more custom. So if we add smoothers to the data set over the hour of the day, uh, and separate it by each uh, day of the week, then we can see that the averages change, the shape of the seasonality changes depending on the day. Uh, for Monday through Friday, you can see this bimodal, these double peaks show up, and that coincides with the working week as well. Uh, however, on Saturday and Sunday, it's a little bit smoother. So there's only a single peak on those days. So if we were to produce a model here, we might be able to use the same daily pattern for Monday through Friday and a different pattern for Saturday and Sunday. I think the three separate daily patterns would be appropriate for this. Another fun visualization you might like to do is a calendar plot and you can use the sugar ants package for this. And um, this is a nice way to overcome the over um, saturation of the plot space. Uh, because it allows you to use some vertical space. So much like you would read a calendar, in this case, each um, individual square represents a day, and this can help observe some unusual days. So for example, September 1st here um, doesn't look like any other Saturdays in that column. There's also weird ha um, something weird happening on December 3rd. There's a bit more of a um, spiky pattern going on. Um, this pattern, this visualization makes it very easy for you to spot unusual observations. And just briefly looking at it some more, October on this last Sunday has this very weird peak at about 1 a.m. Okay, so we've got a few minutes left, 10, 15. Thank you for, if you've had to leave early. Um, thank you for coming. So let's make some forecasts. And I do have to put a disclaimer that the forecasts shown here are in no way good. Um, they're just a way of me demonstrating how to model multiple seasonality. 
in practice, I'd spend a lot more time uh, thinking and working on these forecasting uh, forecasts. So back to the three classes of models, I will demonstrate profit, faster, and STL decomposition. Um, there's a lot of similarities between them, uh, but these three tend to be the most commonly used methods. So for regression modeling, I mentioned before that it is generally fast, um, but the problem is that you would need to know the values well into the future to produce long run forecasts. And the other problem is that the terms don't evolve. So uh, the model will not update over time for changes like the coronavirus. And I personally think that the GAM model of this class or even GAMM -M for adding mixed effects is very powerful for forecasting. Uh, but it is a bit advanced for today. So if you would like to read more about the amazing forecasts you can make with GAM models, I recommend that link there. Uh, the profit package is actually a special case of a GAM. They've used a GAM model internally uh, with some carefully designed features and regresses to make good forecasts. So here's the profit model. It's set up as a GAM and it identifies three main structures in a time series. The growth represented by G, uh, this is your trend term, but they use a special formulation uh, based on um, capacity, carrying capacities. So if there's only, if you think you're Facebook and you're trying to figure out how many people are going to an event, then you can't have more people going than were invited. That was one of the main motivations of this model. So the growth term here can have a carrying capacity, a, an upper bound and a lower bound for that matter. Uh, then it represents seasonality with the lovely Fourier terms. So very flexible representation there. And they also consider holiday regresses as well. And these are just included as dummy variables. And they also introduce the concept of lags and leads. So maybe three days before Christmas, two days might have a different effect and so on. Uh, if you'd like to use the profit model, you can use it directly in the profit package for R. But if you'd like to use it in the Fable ecosystem, uh, I've written a wrapper for it called fable.profit. And the wrapper will allow you to use all the other features with Fable, such as transformations and reconciliation. So profit is fairly simple to specify. You can use the default settings just by calling profit with the response variable to forecast, in this case, arrivals. So the interface for producing a model with Fable is to take your data set, in this case, our carefully prepared Sybil, pipe that into model, and then inside model, you can specify one or more different model specifications. So I could compare two different types of profit models uh, by providing two of these profit functions inside the model function. So that will give me a Mabel, and then I can use that fitted model to produce forecasts with a horizon of two weeks ahead, and then plot it with the end of the data set. So that's the last four weeks shown in black, and the two weeks of future forecasts shown in blue. So you can see as a very quick, um, no analysis needed uh, attempt at producing forecasts for the series, uh, it has produced multiple seasonal forecasts. You can see a slight increase in the first four days of this data set, followed by a decrease for the next five or so, and then increasing again. So it is capturing some of that weekly structure where Monday and Sunday was higher, um, and it is capturing the uh, daily pattern as well. You'll notice that every one of these patterns has two peaks, so it isn't able to handle the interaction with the weekend effect as well. So we can customize the model specification using the formula notation. So you can see previously I had just arrivals and now I've added a formula with the tilde and on the right side, I can customize the profit model which is being fitted. So using the season term, I can customize the parameters of the Fourier terms. So changing the daily seasonal Fourier term to have seven harmonics, so making it uh, fairly flexible, I think a bit more flexible than the default. And I've also chosen multiplicative seasonality. So if the level of the series is higher, the seasonality will be scaled appropriately. 
And I've also set the seasonal pattern for the week to have only four Fourier terms. So it's probably less uh, flexible and giving me a smoother forecast. And flipping between these two, there's not a lot of difference here. Um, perhaps the original defaults were using lots of Fourier terms to begin with. But you could, of course, play around with these. Um, but for the purpose of the talk, there is two seasonal terms, multiple seasonality, uh, using Fourier terms. OK, any questions with regression? Sorry for rushing over that bit. Uh, we've got, next up, we've got state space modeling, which is, although slow and generally inflexible, it's uh, my favorite approach to modeling time series accurately. You can think of this as the boutique method of producing forecasts. And of course, the benefits that I mentioned before is that it can update the model automatically based on changes in the data. Uh, but this is done through a sequential process over the time observations, which makes it relatively slow. And it's my fav favorite because the faster model is the model I wrote and developed for my thesis. So briefly, we'll talk about this. I know the um, equation here might be a bit daunting for some, uh, but essentially you can think of this as a regression model. So here are your x's and here are your betas. However, they the x's evolve over time in some way. Now, uh, you can use the faster model directly with Fable. In fact, faster was the precursor to Fable, and it gave us a lot of ideas for how to write it uh, using the faster package. Now, faster allows all of the aforementioned seasonal terms to be included. We've got seasonal dummies using the season special, lags using lags. This will just use it as a regressor. Fourier terms with Fourier with the number of harmonics and regressors are included in a formula directly in the exact same way you would use an LM function. So here's a very rough example. I figured that the, um, the example with admissions was too subtle to demonstrate this. So I went back to the pedestrian example here. And as a reminder, the weekday pattern has very strong, sharp, different uh, shape and on the weekends there is a different shape as well, a much smoother, less um, bumpy shape. And that highlights a key feature of Fable, uh, of Faster, which is this switching term. So based on some identifier, in this case, if it's a weekday or a weekend, you can switch between the states. So my daily pattern, I have two daily patterns here, one for the weekdays and one for the weekends. And I could have and probably should have done a bit more refining to make the weekends look a bit closer to what is actually shown. Uh, but regardless of if it's a weekday or a weekend, we will have a weekly freer term with a low number of harmonics, giving us a nice smooth shape and a intercept represented with a first order trend. So two weeks ahead plotted with some history um, gives us this graph. And you can see it switches between those two states um, fairly well. So here we've used an exogenous regressor to uh, affect our seasonality. So interacting two different methods. Okay, lastly, and I think is um, perhaps the most powerful way of doing these forecasts at scale. So if you have a lot of forecasts to produce, either regression or decomposition modeling might be suitable for you. So this is a bit more flexible. It all starts with some flexible decomposition like STL plus some other method to forecast the components. And that can be any method, be it regression or state space or even a, another decomposition. It wouldn't make much sense to do that, but you could. Um, so all of these terms depend on the subsequent component models that you use. The problem of this, of course, is that the decomposition you use uh, if it's bad, you're going to get bad results. You're going to get bad forecasts. However, if you're able to decompose the seasonality well, then producing decomposition forecasts can be good because each of the separate season seasonalities can be forecasted separately with a much simpler and possibly more accurate model. Uh, that simpler model will surely be faster though. 
So an STL decomposition or repeating the STL decomposition several times allows you to decompose each of the seasonalities into separate time series. So we can represent YT, our data set, as the sum of our annual seasonality, weekly and daily seasonality, plus some trend and some residuals. So the STL model is available in feasts and we can use it using the same interface. You take your data set and you model an STL decomposition on the arrivals data. And then if you wanted to access the decomposed components, you would use the components function, which can then be plotted. So as you can see, we've run into the same problem where we've got too many observations to show on a simple graph. So I'm going to use the first suggestion and just throw away most of that so that we can zoom in and have a look. Uh, the scale of this is a bit small, but you can see the trend is moving around quite a lot. It's changing almost every day. So that's a bit too flexible for my liking. Um, the seasonal year, which is the third line from the top, uh, is very bumpy, but at the weekly level, the fourth line down, we start to see our very strong seasonal pattern. And our daily pattern is changing a lot. So in the middle around March 14, you can see this double peaked shape, but at March 21 onwards, it becomes a bit more of a mess. So I think the defaults here aren't very well designed for this type of data set. So the main opportunity you have to customize a decomposition, uh, specifically a lowest decomposition, is by changing the window. So the window controls the amount of observations that you smooth over. So generally speaking, I've increased the, the windows here to give me smoother patterns that change slower over time, because we don't expect our seasonality uh, to change over the course of a few days, which we're seeing in the daily data set here. So by customizing these parameters, I've set the trend window to be five weeks, this annual seasonality to never change, an infinite window, which is reasonable for only six years of data set, uh, weekly pattern changes every five, with a window of five weeks, and daily window of one week, I get another plot that I can't see much of. So let's zoom at the end. And now we can see much more consistent patterns for at least the weekly pattern and the daily pattern, the fourth and fifth plots. And our trend is so much smoother as well, which would be better for producing forecasts. So the big idea, as I mentioned before, you take each of those components. In this case, I've taken the weekly seasonality, and then you can produce a model for each of those components. Here I've used a simple lag model, a seasonal naive model. And you can see I can forecast that weekly pattern really well. There's no uncertainty in this model. I can then also compute the forecasts for the daily seasonality. Also very easy to forecast. Now a little bit trickier, but if we take the whatever's left over, so the trend plus the remainder, after removing all of the seasonality, I can then produce a another model. This is the main model in the component decomposition model. Uh, I spent a little bit of time tweaking the parameters, but it's by no means perfect. And you see it makes some slight adjustments at the first uh, couple of days and forecast that ahead. Now the tricky part, which is done automatically, is taking these three forecasts and also the annual seasonal forecasts and combining them. So adding them and the intervals together, uh, which can be done automatically for you using the decomposition model function. So here I specify the decomposition specification. That's my STL model. And then the component models for each of the elements of that decomposition. So I've named this decomposition specification. Uh, notice that I haven't provided the one for seasonal year and by default, it will use seasonal naive. So these were a bit unnecessary to add anyway, that's automatic. So using that specification in our model, we can produce two weeks ahead of forecasts and you can see these are uh, collecting quite a lot of detail that the other mod models uh, missed.
So the other models averaged over and smoothed perhaps a bit too much. Um, this STL decomposition model is working fairly well. Okay. Sorry for going a little bit over time. Uh, if there is opportunity for questions, I'm happy to take them. Uh, if not, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter or um, contact me however you'd like. I'll do my best to answer some questions. Thank you all for coming. And I hope you've learned something new about multiple seasonality. Have a wonderful day. <laughs> Do we, do we have time for any uh, questions? Thank you, Mitchell. Thank you for for the past uh, from from the UK to your uh, future in Australia. Um, I'm not sure there are any questions yet, but we had a really good discussion, and everyone said how much they love your uh, package and uh, how much they appreciate your work. So thank you again for joining us. Uh, I think uh, yes. Also, I don't know, uh, Mitchell, if you're on our NHS Earth luck yet. Uh, but if you want to join it, you're very welcome because I think Oscar uh, would love to discuss um, this webinar. Um, and uh, yes, I'm not sure there is anything else at all. Um, so I will stop recording now. And if any questions appear, um, again, you're very welcome to answer them. And thank you, Bowman, as well. Um, um, and yeah, as usual, supporting our community. Yeah, pleasure to be here. Thank you so much.